And tonight we are beginning a, uh, a study of sorts of the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, 1689. John is already shaking his head, nodding and smiling in approval. Maybe after I'm done you won't. Uh, but remember, folks, with, uh, and we are grateful for what the Lord has provided us. But we also have our limitations with space. So Wednesday nights uh, started to take a turn toward more of a general discipling. It's not perfect, but, but it's at least something along those lines in addition to those who are able to meet in groups outside of the walls of our uh, building. But let me uh, lead us in prayer, and then we're going to start our study. Father in heaven, thank you for revealing yourself. Thank you for giving your word and sending your son, who is the word incarnate, but then writing it down. And I pray that, that we will actually be able to fathom to some degree the generations before us that stood, that stood and was, they were willing to die that the scriptures would be written down, translated into our language. And they took very special caution in making sure that what they had were the actual scriptures. It's very easy for us to take it for granted because we can get a copy of the Bible rather easily. We can give it or get it in various trans, um, yeah, translations. Lord, help us to appreciate what you've done and how you've revealed yourself, not only generally in creation, but especially in your Son and, yes, even in the written Word. Make this a fruitful endeavor I pray amen so lesson one of the Holy Scriptures and let me start by saying that I am using various resources of course in my seminary studies we did cover the confessions uh, not not only the Baptist confessions and I appreciate that I'm glad that we had to look at other confessions but I'm going to lean on the founders ministry a lot Founders Ministry, of course, affiliated with Dr. Tom Askell, a fellow Southern Baptist, and a just a seems to be just a gentle spirit, but but doesn't mean weak. I mean, Dr. Askell knows what he's doing, what he's talking about, but he just has a very uh, Christ-like, shepherdly tenderness about him, and I, I want to emulate that more and more. I'm going to use their modern English version, and you should be thankful for that. <laughs> And I'm not here to poke fun at the, the folks that will say, I'm King James only. I'm like, no, you're really not. Uh, and if, if you were, you, if you really had a, a 1611 Bible, you wouldn't even be able to read the letters. And that's not making fun. That's just reality. It's old English. And I'm, I'm not kidding. They spell things differently. The letters are, I don't even know what letter that is. So I'm going to use the modern English version, version for our lessons. You can go to founders.org. And there, it's very easy to access the 1689 Confession. And let me give you a setting or context for what brought about this. And I want you to keep in mind, 1689. What major event over a century before, actually more than a century and a half before, what, what, what happened? It involved a monk. Reformation. The Protestant Reformation, October 31st, 1517. Now, that's not really the beginning of the Reformation. It's already in the works, but that's kind of the official, here I stand, and these are the, you know, the 95 theses on the door. But, but there was already an unrest in people saying, uh, really with the Roman Catholic Church. Martin Luther, by the way, did not set out to bring down the Roman Catholic Church. He wanted her to reform. Mm -hmm. He wanted to see change that lined up with the right authority. Of course, that didn't go so well. Actually, I think it did go well, just it didn't come easily or without pain. But the Protestant Reformation there, October 31st, 1517, 
is followed uh, by what is called the First London Baptist Confession in 1644. And you say, Daryl, that's, that's over a century uh, after the, the, quote, birth of the Protestant Reformation. Folks, things didn't move quickly. <laughs> it's not like today. So there, there's a progression of, of, of these events happening. And that first Confession of Faith was commissioned in 1644, but the battles of the Reformation largely fueled the people who were going to compose it. Those battles still fresh in their minds, and they're still fighting those battles. What is our authority? And folks, it is so relevant today. Authority. Authority. And so many people want to say, well, there is no authority. Well, should I take you as an authority on that? I mean, they're chopping out their legs from underneath them. People want to live in autonomy. And to some degree, there is autonomy, but autonomy can be dangerous too. I'm going to mention a group called the Anabaptists. I remember early on in my ministry at South Whitwell Baptist Church, one of the members said, so you've been to seminary school and all that, so you're going to know the answers to my questions. I'm like, well, ask the question first now. Just coming out of seminary doesn't mean you know everything. But he goes, who were the Anti-Baptists? I said, I don't know. I said, I think you're talking about the Anabaptists. He goes, well, whoever. Who are, who are that? <laughs> so, well, the Anabaptist, also known as the Rebaptizers, although they would not like that distinction. You know why? Anyone want to venture a guess? Rebaptizers? Yes. See, so you're talking about coming out of Roman Catholicism where they practice infant baptism. Well, the Anabaptists would say that's no baptism at all. That's why they don't like being called the rebaptizers. They would say, no, no, we are the actual baptized now. So even though Anabaptist is typically called rebaptized or the rebaptizers, they would have said no, because that was nothing. You think the Roman Catholic Church liked that, appreciated that? No. They did not. One of the benefits of infant baptism, and I'm not knocking on my Presbyterian brothers and sisters, but one of the, in, uh, one of the advantages of infant baptism for the RCC is that, well, you're officially a member of the church, and when you become of age to be able to work, you can tithe. <laughs> so, and, and not only can you, you will. Um, you know, why? Well, I, I had no, no voice in that. Well, there you go. So the Anabaptists were a bit more radical, though. You say, how radical were they? Uh, well, one particular practice was that they would perform baptisms and be baptized without clothing. You mean they were in their undergarments? No. No, I said without clothing. <laughs> Any. Yeah, it's a bit radical. Uh, and I'm not going to introduce that practice to Grace Fellowship. Well, Jesus didn't even do that, so I don't know where they got that. Well, that's just, they were, they were kind of a unique bunch. And here's the thing. Those who would later compile the Baptist Confession of Faith, though they would agree with the Anabaptists in that we see baptism as only for those who are confessing faith in Jesus as Savior. We line up with you there, but you've got some weird practices. You're seen as very odd, and it wasn't about just how people view us, but we don't want to be linked up with you. Okay, think about this. Now, Grace Fellowship, our technical name is Grace Fellowship of North Hamilton County, but we are affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention. But think about our fellow Baptist brethren who have the word Baptist in their name. I pastored South Whitwell Baptist Church. I grew up at Oak Street Baptist Church. It has happened to me where someone said, oh, so you're like those Westboro people. They're Baptist. No, I'm nothing like them. But, but they have Baptist in their name. Yes, they do. But they're an odd bunch. And doctrinally unsound on a few things and their practice is abhorrent so might there be a reason why we would say no we're not like those baptists yeah and that's what you're seeing here is that these um these particular baptists <laughs> it's funny how i just said the, and they were particular as <laughs> i didn't even mean to do that you're you're welcome and some of you are going i have no idea what i'll explain 
But these uh, particular Baptists wanted to make sure that we are not associated in the same thought as the Anabaptist, other than we, we do not see infant baptism as biblical. But we are not like them. So part of that fuels the push to make a confession. Here is who we are. Now, some today would argue, but that will push people away from coming to your building. Yeah, it might. It might. And, and why is that a bad thing? I'm not talking about pretending like we are elite and, and uh, we're going to have someone standing at the door to see if you're worthy. But if someone wanted to come into Grace Fellowship who denies the Trinity, but they want to make this their church home, they would not be allowed to even be presented as members. Because part of what we hold to is that we are Trinitarian. And it is a substantial doctrine that I don't think you can deny it and be Christian. At least not in full knowledge. So this idea of open the front door wide and, and, and make the back door narrow? No. Make the front door narrow. Because those who seek to align with you, seek to join with you, need to have doctrinal distinctions in their thinking. This is who we are. This is who we're not. And if you think I'm just being bullheaded there, folks... There are plenty of people today who will tell you, I'm a Baptist, and yet they will deny that God's Word is sufficient. They will tell you, I don't think it matters if Jesus was sinless. Well, you better get that figured out quickly. So these distinctives are, I think, necessary, and, and this is part of the fuel for why these confessions. And the Baptists weren't the only ones. In fact, the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is really good, but it's Presbyterian in nature. It's in 1646, not, not long after that first London Confession. The second London Baptist Confession borrows heavily from the Westminster Confession. Westminster Confession. It does. It's not plagiarism. They're, they're simply saying we align, we're of like mind with this. We, we differ here and we differ here, but, but here and here and here, man, we, we line up with you. These are our brothers. Uh, they're going to baptize infants. It's known as pedo baptism We're not going to do that, but we see them as brothers and sisters in Christ. But to, to worship together consistently, that's not going to happen because they're going to be constantly wanting to baptize the infants, and we're going to say no. <laughs> So that, that's part of the reason why you do have room for denominations. One of the things that cults will, will ask you is, why does God permit denominations? Because there is room for some liberty, some. Not all, but some. But that's what we have. The London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is not as beefy, not as substantive as the second one. The Westminster Confession is really, uh, really solid. But then the second London is really solid, but Baptist in nature. And we could, we could and should be thankful for both. We really should. Now, what about our context? Well, our context is that Grace Fellowship is distinctly Baptist in its formation. Folks, from the very start, I, I made it known that we, would, that we would be Baptist and that I would lead the congregation to be Southern Baptist. I, if that surprises anyone, then, then you weren't listening that day. But, I mean, from the very start, I made that the point. And the church that sent us out, sent us out very generously with the understanding that this is what I, what I would do. I'm not going to lie to them. Um, now, that doesn't mean if something major happens that, that I can't leave it. But, but we began distinctly Baptist and then in particular as Southern Baptist. The London Confessions precede the formation of the Southern Baptist Convention by about two centuries. At least the first one does. But I want to give something to you here. Those who would go on to form the Southern Baptist Convention in Augusta, Georgia in 1845 ascribed to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. Now, hear me on that. Because one of the big arguments within the SBC, and I hear this often from my more Arminian brothers, and yeah, I do see them as brothers. 
well, we need to get back to being traditional Baptists. I agree wholeheartedly. And like, but you're Calvinistic. I'm like, I am. Why would you want to go back to our roots? Because <laughs> guess what our roots were? Oh, it wasn't that. Oh, but they were. Let me give you this quote, and that you can find this on Founders Ministry. The 1689 Confession was the, notice the definite article, the confessional statement of the church or association of every one of the 293 delegates who gathered in Augusta, Georgia to organize the Southern Baptist Convention in 1845. Every single delegate held to a particular Calvinistic view. Every one of them. So when my Baptist brethren, my Southern Baptist brethren, talk about let's get back to being traditional, I agree. Let's do that. And then they look at you like, well, no, no, that can't be right. I'm like, go do your homework. And you will find that to be true. You will find that to be true. From our beginning, that is true. Now, there were general Baptists. There are more of the Arminian strain of theology, while the particular Baptists are those of the Calvinistic theology. And even within Southern Baptists, there were both. But the early, the predominant number of early Southern Baptists were Calvinistic. Um, I think it was Dr. Tom Nettles, who is really great on Baptist history and Southern Baptist history. Dr. Nettles was asked, and he's at Southern Seminary. John, do you do you have any courses with him, or have you had any courses? I did one of his courses. Oh, okay, so he allowed you in there. Yes. Okay. Our friend Craig made him mad one time, and I went, "Dude, what are you doing, making Dr. Nettles mad?" But uh, <laughs> but anyway, Dr. Nettles was asked by someone not Calvinistic, you know, name me one early Southern Baptist who was a Calvinist. And he said, how about you name one who wasn't? And the person was like, what? He goes, go do your research. Go do your research. Unless y'all think that I'm going to start passing out tulips and putting up posters of Zwingli and Calvin and other, I'm not doing that. But folks, this is formative. No, John, you're not allowed to do that. And I see you're wearing your Southern Seminary hoodie. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to wear my Southwestern or Midwestern. Uh, they wouldn't fit anymore if I had them. But, but this, is, this is necessary, folks. If we're going to explain who we are and why we hold to what we hold to, this information is necessary. Don't get into fights, and there are plenty to be gotten into if you're not careful, because there is a big battleground within the SBC, and not only the SBC, but in particular the SBC of this. We didn't start as Calvinists. I'll just push back on that and say, go do your homework. And I, and I mean that graciously, I really do. Uh, one other anecdotal thing, I remember hearing someone from my home church, well, Spurgeon wasn't. I went, oh my, oh my goodness. Have you read, because we do have Spurgeon sermon notes online, you can get them very easily, and they're, they're accurate. Um, I'll just give you, well, let's just read this. Spurgeon's congregation unashamedly held to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith and were Calvinistic in their theology. Spurgeon didn't make any apologies for that. So yes, the great Spurgeon was very pronounced in that. He was. He didn't hide it. He, he, in fact, they wanted people to know in London, this is who we are. But Daryl, they, 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 they can't grow if they do that. But they did because they trusted God to grow the church, not their pragmatism to grow the church. And we have to be careful not to fall under that same spell of going, what are they doing to get people? Pragmatism. Oh, well, then we've got to do that too. No, we are faithful to the Lord and His Word, and we trust that He will build this according to His methods and means. And it takes time, and I know it's a struggle. So let me give you a personal note before we go to a general overview. I gladly ascribe to most of the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. Well, how can you be our senior pastor leading us to be not only Southern Baptist, 
but leading us to be a second London Baptist Confession of Faith Church and not wholeheartedly hold to every single sentence in the confession. Well, there are only a few places where I differ. And I don't think that by differing in a few places, it means that I can't be considered 1689. I'll give you one in particular. Um, in chapter 22, paragraph 7, the 1689 London Baptist Confession ascribes to a change of the Sabbath day from Saturday to Sunday. I, I don't hold to that. I'm not a Sabbatarian. I, I think the Sabbath is Saturday, and it's the Lord's Day that is Sunday. Mm -hmm. In fact, I saw this recently where a Baptist argued from the 1689 that in fact the Sabbath did change from Saturday to Sunday and this was on I was watching this on a on a video I'm doing my preparation and there's comments and I knew or I didn't know it but but I saw it instantaneously a Presbyterian guy jumps in and said aha and thus he did the same thing with circumcision and I went that's why you don't do that because, the, I mean, he was ready. See, God did the same thing with circumcision. Now circumcision replaces baptism, and that's why you baptize infants. No, I don't think so. So I don't hold to that view. I think that the Sabbath is still Saturday, but that the Lord's Day is Sunday. And you see, not only in the, in the very early years of the church, but think about as the gospel spread, who did Paul preach the gospel to mostly? And where do we see the most gospel fruit? Not the Jews, Gentiles. They didn't grow up with the Sabbath. They grew up with the Lord's Day, and so do we. Okay, and there are other points, and, and we'll get those. We'll, we'll, we'll look at those. Uh, I will be respectful, respectful, respectful of those who labored over this document, even when I slightly differ with them. And I admit that I could be wrong. Might I change my view as we go through this? That can happen. It just hasn't happened yet. But I admit right here, right now, I could be wrong in some of my differences. If I can't do that, then I'm not a good teacher. Well, man, you're letting people know that you don't know everything. You already know that I don't know everything. It's okay. Let's do a very general overview of the... 10 paragraphs of chapter 1. Folks, I, I was going to print this. There's all 10 paragraphs. I'm just going to let you go online and find them because for those of you who know me, I do 7 font for my notes. I don't want you getting frustrated when I, I can't read this. So I didn't do that. Let me just give you an overview. And then I'm going to open up a brief opportunity for discussion. And then we're going to commit the rest of the time to prayer. This is an introductory lesson. And it's of the Holy Scriptures. The first paragraph, the Scriptures are sufficient, authoritative, and necessary. And I know you don't have it right in front of you unless you've got it pulled up on your phone. But the Scriptures, and, and by the way, this, this is repeated more than just here in the first paragraph. There is sufficient, authoritative, and necessary. Well, let me make a distinction here because some of you are going to be asking, is this Sola Scriptura? Yes. But don't misunderstand something. Sola Scriptura does not mean that Scripture is the only authority, but it is the ultimate authority. And, and you need to get that right there. The Roman Catholic Church will deny that. Who might they see as authoritative, equal to or even greater than the Scriptures? The Pope. And again, this is not me bashing them. They will tell you this. How about the Eastern Orthodox? who claims to be the true church, while the RCC claims to be the true church, even the, the, that big schism that they had. What would the Eastern Orthodox Church claim as authoritative? Tradition. What's that? Tradition. Tradition. Just as equal. Just as equal. I have a real big issue with that. Very big issue. Well, the church fathers, even the church fathers, understood that the scriptures are authoritative to the highest degree. Even the church fathers. And who gets to name them the church fathers? I'm just, just asking. So Sola Scriptura is the idea that Scripture is the highest authority and it is infallible. It's perfect. And at this congregation, authority-wise, we hold to Sola Scriptura. We do. 
They are not lacking in anything. We can borrow from the church fathers and glean from Christians of days before us. We can. And we can even see some authority there, but not to match the Scriptures. The second paragraph speaks of the collection of the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament and the inspiration of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all, notice that, all Scripture. And of course, Paul, by the time he's writing this, they have the full canon of the Old Testament, and they do have some of the New. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, one of the things you're going to hear people do today is they're going to say, well, I have a different interpretation. Be, be real careful there. It's a very common uh, throwback. Um, let me just give you one thing here to consider. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Peter says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God's Word says what it says. And this, well, that's your interpretation. Be very careful whenever someone throws that at you. And be very careful from using that. Now, sometimes people do have very poor hermeneutical, uh, I won't even call them skills, deficiencies. And, and you can say that is a very, very poor interpretation. Here's why. Not because of my thoughts, but here's the clear teaching of Scripture. So, the collection of these books and the inspiration of them from the Lord. Now, the Roman Catholic Church will tell you that the RCC is responsible for the Scriptures, where we will argue, no, the Scriptures are responsible for the Church. Okay? Third, the third paragraph, you will notice that they talk about the Apocrypha and how it is not included in their canon of Scripture. Now, this is, it's not funny, but think about the Geneva Bible. Does anyone know the year that it came out? The full one, not just the New Testament. 1560. And when was the first edition of the King James Bible? 1611. Okay. By the way, the King James Bible that people use today is like the fourth, is it the fourth or fifth revision? It's, it's, nowhere, it's not the 1611. Here's the thing, the Geneva Bible and the 1611 King James Bible both had the Apocrypha. They did. Um, reformers would look at the Apocrypha and say, well, there's some benefit there, but they're not divinely inspired. There's some historical benefits, but no, they're not the Word of God. And others, well, in the RCC said, yes, they are. So there's, again, part of the debate but the Apocrypha, according to the Presbyterians and the Baptists, are saying, no, that is not in the canon of Scripture. And they made that very clear, open statement, knowing, knowing that there would be a good many people saying, then we will never, ever align with you, which would drive modern church growth people nuts. Oh, you, you got to be all things to all people, and you got to, no, you stand on what's true. You stand on what is true, not what is pragmatically successful, which really is not success, at least not in God's view. Fourth, the authority of Scripture. He comes back to that, or they come back to that. Fifth paragraph, the authenticity of Scripture. Sixth, the sufficiency of Scripture. Seventh, the clarity of Scripture. And I do get a little tickled over this because the actual wording is called the perspicuity of Scripture. I remember in seminary learning about the perspicuity of Scripture. I, I think I recall the professor kind of giggling because sure enough, one student said, what does perspicuity mean? He went, clarity, clearness. So, I would never know what that word meant, <laughs> that, but that's a word they knew. So the clarity of Scripture, the perspicuity of Scripture. Eight, paragraph eight, the authenticity of the Scriptures in their original manuscripts. You mean the Paul didn't use the English Bible? No, he didn't. There was no English language. The ninth paragraph, interpreting Scripture by using Scripture. 
not experience or feeling or whims or wishes. What that scripture means to me, stop right there. Stop right there. What that scripture means. A lot of damage has been done with probably very sincere hearted people going let's have a Bible study they read a passage and go what does that mean to you well, let me tell you what it means to me and it's a hodgepodge of who knows what what does it mean save yourself from a lot of doctrinal error and heresy and tenth sola scriptura again these brothers in the Lord were very upfront, very firm. We hold to the sufficiency of Scripture, the authority of Scripture, the clarity of Scripture, the infallibility of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, the Word of God. That is our highest authority here. And they were saying this in a time where that was not a popular view. But look what God did with that, folks. Did his church die? No. Do you know that this was used to foster in what is called the first great awakening? It was a mighty move of God in his timing. But a sad reality is people got away from that here in the States. They got away from it. So there came a second great awakening, which, which was not great at all because it was emotion-based, not scriptural authority-based. Pragmatism. How do we get the people? God gets his people. Well, he's not getting them quick enough. God gets his people. We're going to help him out. He doesn't need you. He'll use us as a means to communicate. But God promised, he himself said it, I will build my church. Well, Lord, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to help you out. And I want to just really quick bring some points of, of order from Scripture. When God made Abraham a promise, I will give you a son. And it was taking too long. What was Sarai, who became Sarah, what was her suggestion? Let's help God out. And what was the product of that? Who? Ishmael. Thanks a lot. Did God need their help? And when Abraham says, here he is, God says, I reject him. I reject him. You will have a son with your wife like I promised you. You just got to wait for my timing. <laughs> but it's already been like 10 years. Oh, we got more, more than double that. But I know what I'm doing. King Saul, I'm going to help God out. <laughs> I don't need that. Cost him his crown. King David, I'm going to help God out with the census. I don't need that. Peter even, Lord, these, these Romans are going to take you and arrest you. I'm going to help you out. I don't need you to arrest, or I don't need you to help me. And I'm going to the cross, Peter. Get out of the way. Folks, be careful. Because the modern pragmatic movement says, if you want your church to grow, if you want your church to be successful, point A, point B, point C, point D, get to the what? The Scriptures and prove something because here's what you're going to prove who are you going to listen to and who are you going to believe are you going to believe the god who created us and the god who promised to build his church or the modern church growth people what are we going to do we have to be people of the book and what we're seeing more and more are and i mentioned this sunday even supposedly conservative churches are abandoning abandoning this more and more all in the in the name of well we we've got to we've got to grow we can't afford to lose people if we confront people over their sin they'll leave but the bible eh. well if we do that then we won't grow uh, like we did last year uh, what are you doing who's who does this belong to who bought it and what was the currency jesus bought it his blood was the currency and he promised to build it who will you, who will I believe? Okay. Questions, discussion, and let's keep it on this. Not like, you know, did Adam have a belly button? So, discussion, questions? I think one thing that's interesting is uh, people, you know, it's King James only, you know, like that's, that's the thing. And, but uh, the original scripture didn't have 
chapters and verses in there. Right, right. They, they didn't. No, we did that. We, got, we didn't change the word, but we divided it up so it made it simpler to, to find it. But, uh, you know, the, the original is the original, and that's, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, else's copies and, stuff. And, and and by the time that we have the uh, London Baptist Confession, the Westminster Confession, the Second London Baptist Confession, by that time, the Bible has now been broken down into our, because English translations are coming about, so we do have chapter distinctions, verse, or chapter divisions, verse divisions, and even book divisions, where, like the books of Samuel in the Hebrew Bible, that's one book. The Chronicles are one book. And you say, oh no, what did they, they just broke it in, it's the same material. So, yeah, and I want to, I want to say this for my brothers and sisters in the Lord who do hold to the King James only view, which I do not hold to. One thing, I, I just like with the Anabaptists, one thing that I can put my arm around them with is this. I too want to make sure that what we hold in our hands has not just been thrown together. I too want to know that this has been a scholarly work to make sure that what we have uh, is translated in, into what it should be. Not some modern aberration aberration of, well, let's take out he and make it they. No. We're not going to be gender neutral for the sake of conformity to a society. We're going to speak in definite language. So, so I can appreciate them in that vein of wanting to make sure that the scriptures are, are held in, uh, in high regard and that the translation is pure, but they just go too far in thinking that even usually the 1611 only folks think that not only are the scriptures inspired, but even the translators are inspired, and that's very easy to refute. So, others? Phil? I've always struggled with the, the statement that the scriptures are inspired in their original mm -hmm. autographs. So, if that's our position, mm -hmm. is it accurate to say this is the Word of God? You can. And the, the fact is this. Number one, we don't have the original autographs. However, of the multitude of copies that we have, it is so clear to see that they have come from a common source. But here's where we also have to admit that with translations, there are some things. Um, I'll give you one argument in particular, and this was a person who was, was trying to make their case to me that the King James Bible the translators were, were just as inspired. And I said, if that is true, go to Second Chronicles 19 and 1 Samuel 10. Excuse me, excuse me. Second Samuel um, 10, 1 Chronicles 19. I think I've got that right. And explain to me, because these are written centuries apart, but they're of the same event, how there could be a huge difference in number and name. Now, I had a benefit here that I had studied it in the original languages, and I wasn't trying to be a jerk. But the person looked at that, and he goes, well, one says 700 chariots, one says 7,000. I went, yeah. Why didn't the translators get that right? And notice the name, Shobach and Shofak. Why, why didn't they get that right? He just looked at me like, uh, uh, and then, so this was his, so you're saying the Bible has errors? I said, no, not at all. In fact, it's really rather easy to resolve because the translators were not inspired, number one. Thank God for the work they did, but they were not inspired. The writers were. That's a distinction you've got to make. The writers were. Paul was. Not whatever transcriber or translator. Paul. And I'm not going to go into a whole discussion because it will lead us off the track. But, but Hebrews used uh, uh, Hebrew letters to, to speak for numbers like the Vav and the Zion, which are very similar. Um, and Shabak and Shavak are the same person. But the manuscripts are going to look a little different. And so it, it wasn't very hard. But if we held to the view that the translators were just as inspired, they should have fixed that. They didn't. The name Reul in the Old Testament... Reul, Deul, same person. How can an R and a D be the same? Well, in English, R. English, D. Look at it in Hebrew. They're almost identical. So, anyway. 
But uh, yeah, it is, it is far better to say that the scriptures in their original form are inspired, but not the translators. But, but yet we can say with confidence that what we hold in our hands, it's the word of God. Well, God promised that his word would stand. Yeah. He, he, made, he maintained it down through the years through the translators. And, and when you look at what the Bible has gone through and the works of people who were burned at the stake, think about that. Wycliffe, Tyndall, people burned at the stake. Why? Because they wanted people to be able to read the Bible in English. Oh, what a crime. And they died horrible deaths to make sure that what you and I have is the Word of God. That's a rich history. All right, any, anyone else before we close this down? In April, my wife helps me out on the camera and we go to prayer time. One thing. Yes, ma'am about the infant baptism. I, I was raised in Lutheran church. Uh -huh. They would hold it infant baptism. I was an infant. Um, and then after we got married, I was in Baptist church and, I, and you know, I said, oh, okay, it's supposed to be baptized after you're saved. Well, I sure wasn't saved when I was a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what was going on even. I don't remember being poured on, you know. Uh, so I think the, the, the bad thing about that is the church is that Teach that. I think it started with Catholics, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Luther, Luther didn't figure that one out, unfortunately. <laughs> but, but people have this this feeling that our oh, baptized when I was baby, so I'm saying. No, you're not. <laughs> which is which, which is odd to me, especially because I had a co-worker when I was in seminary in Fort Worth. He was Roman Catholic in name, but not in practice. But this is what he would say. He goes, but I was baptized. And I'm like, do you realize that in Roman Catholic theology, there is no uh, security of the believer? He goes, I don't know any of that. I'm like, you, and I, I shared the gospel with him repeatedly. My parents bought him a Bible. But I'm just saying, I'm like, it, it struck me as odd that, that someone who is part of a church that rejects, and they flat out reject the eternal security of the believer. Oh, yeah, would, yeah, they do. And, and then, but then they would say, but at least I was baptized as an infant. Okay, that's a whole other topic. Uh, and we will get to baptism one of these nights. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I will say this, and we are going to close and get a prayer time. I have great respect for men like R.C. Sproul, who's now with the Lord. And Dr. Sproul, could, he could beat me and... Bible uh, trivia if he were on painkillers for wisdom teeth. The man was brilliant. I differ with him, and that's okay, because even he would say he's not right on everything. I don't hold to their view, but I love them, appreciate them, and thankful for what they contributed to the body of Christ, and, uh, and gladly would listen to him speak at conferences. Mm -hmm. However, um, I, I have a different theology when it comes to certain particulars. Okay, let me get that off.